Well, in offering this course, I uh, found that um, it can be helpful early on if we would uh, sort of review some of the concepts, major concepts. We're going to do that in a couple of lectures. This one will be about cells and cell components. Again, it's just a quick review to kind of bring some of that information back to the forefront. It may be a while since you've talked about it. We'll also do the same thing with some genetic concepts in, in later lectures. So let's do, let's do cell. Let's talk a little bit about cell structure. Uh, cell components, and hopefully we will uh, bring some a little bit of new information to you. All right, so what I want to do is I would like to talk about uh, major cellular components, just a reminder of some names and things. We'll talk about nuclear DNA and human chromosomes and replication, remind you about that remind you about mitochondrial DNA because it turns out to be a critical component. Uh, when we talk about human examples, um, the, the structures of mitochondrial DNA and the uses for that, the pathways that are involved. And then I thought we might go over a few pathways um, just to talk about so we can kind of integrate both the cellular functioning as well as the genetic information that goes along. So let's start out with that by looking at uh, some of the major cellular components. Just again, yeah, just kind of looking at names. So what do we have? Well, we have these cellular organelles. Again, of course, we're talking about mammalian cells, human cells. So the, we have a, a plasma membrane or a cell membrane um, that involve where we have transport systems in and out. There are little pockets of openings. Uh, we have the, the nuclear region and nucleolus, uh, which contains the chromatin, the genetic materials. And we have all the other structures, such as endoplasmic reticulums, the little canals, uh, the rough or smooth, the rough being where uh, we have the translational process going on um, with form of the ribosomes. We have all sorts of other filaments and, and Golgi apparatus and things, all the cytoplasm. Okay. Uh, other things, of course, we have our mitochondria. We'll talk about those. Okay. And we think that the mitochondria are probably of, of uh, endosymbiotic origin. In other words, they were, or primordial cells did not have mitochondria. Mitochondria moved in as potentially as bacterial forms. And now there's complete synergism between the two because we have to have uh, the genes that are in the mitochondrial DNA are critical. They're not, some of those are not found in the nuclear region. And of course, all the things in the nuclear region that are necessary for mitochondrial function. So the genes have been interchanged um, as well, you know, form. So not only is the mitochondria the powerhouse of the cell, as it's called, because of the pathways, the energy pathways that are there, but also it's uh, just linked, uh, completely linked with the nuclear DNA, both in cellular function and in its own needs. Okay. This little cell is a little neural cell, just showing you, you know, kind of what the what they might actually look like in some type of, of form. Okay. Now, how do we know about organelles and how do we figure it out? Well, the, the primary method that has been to do centrifugation. And centrifugation uh, would basically would take a series of cells, or, you know, uh, a population of cells, uh, lice the cells itself, lice the, the uh, depending on what part we're looking for, um, we might lyse the, the entire thing. So we would lyse the uh, external plasma membrane, we'd lyse the nuclear membrane, their chemicals that let us do that. And there's even ways to lyse the mitochondrial membranes. So we could do that. Other times we don't want to go that stringent. We just do the plasma membrane itself. That leaves the nucleus intact. It leaves the mitochondria intact, the Golgi apparatus, etc. Then it goes into a, a a test tube with a gradient, usually a sucrose gradient, a sugar gradient is one of the ways you can do it. And then you just centrifuge it. And these are done in ultra centrifuges. Many of you have seen those. If not, there are several around the department. Uh, these are centrifuges that can run from all oh, 60,000 RPM, uh, some of them up to uh, 150,000 RPM. So they have a massive amount of, of G-force that they can put on the system. Um, often these runs take, uh, you know, 24 to 48 hours that you'll actually run. And very slowly, the organelles will move through the medium, this sucrose gradient, uh, and then we'll eventually find a spot where their weight, their molecular weight, or physical weight, uh, will, will stop them. And you can go in and, and find what you're looking for as bands uh, in, this, in this region. Uh, very commonly, you still use it to, to when we want to isolate pure mitochondria. 
Uh, we can do it this way. There's some, you know, there's faster ways to do it with the mitochondrial things, but we can we can actually get to the organelles themselves by centrifugation. Still used quite commonly in cell labs, um, molecular labs. But that's how we know it forms. And you may have seen things like Swedgeberg units, S units. You know, I think when you're taught about uh, the ribosomes, you have a small subunit and a large subunit, and very often it says it's a 16 S unit or something as Swedgeberg units. That's really just a measure of how far they will migrate and where they would be located. So if we say it's a Swedgeberg unit, we know roughly where to look inside the tube after X amount of time of, of centrifugation. Okay. All right, so we obviously have these components. What we're interested in genetics are the DNA. So let's talk a little bit about nuclear DNA and then mitochondrial DNA. Just as a reminder, most of the time of a cell's life, <clears throat> the cell is in, um, is in G1 or G0, right, as a cell cycle. The DNA is mostly beads on a string. There's some compaction, particularly in areas that are centromeric uh, or areas that are at, at the ends of the chromosomes, you'll have more compaction. But mostly you have these nucleosomes and then the intermediate DNA in between them and the more nucleosomes spread out. So this is so the DNA can function, okay? We don't have them as the chromosomes, right? The, the, the idea that it exists as chromosomes uh, and, the, and the duplicated dyad form uh, is, is just a misnomer that people have. Most the, This is what your chromosomes, your DNA would look like. It's chromatin material, a mix of DNA and then histone proteins along with other objects, okay? So that would be what it looks like. Now, this is the G1, just to remind you, okay, G1. Uh, there is some compaction there. Uh, it's not all beads on a string. There is some. Um, but then we move into the, the area of replication. So synthesis and replication, there's a number of, once you hit these boundaries or checkpoints, of course, um, all sorts of proteins that are produced. There, there's then proteins that are available here. Of course, the most active time for, for, for transcription must be out here when the DNA is loose. So that's in G1, G0. Um, and in synthesis, we go through replication. We take each of the of these chromatids and they, they get replicated to make a sister and we get some compaction going on. Certainly by the time you get to G2 boundary, you're probably at a 30 nanometer or so compaction. So you've taken most everything and rolled it up and started to make it, making solenoids. Spend most of G2 then uh, prepping the DNA for the process of meiosis or mitosis, depending on what cell types they're in. Um, with the addition of things like lamin and other proteins that form, help form the scaffolds. And then ultimately you hit uh, mitosis or meiosis. And by the end of uh, prophase, you end up with what we would think of as classical uh, chromosomes, which would be, you know, um, what at least the public thinks of as chromosomes. These are the dyad forms, the highly compressed dyad forms. The reason those are so common, you know, is because throughout much of last century, when we had microscopes, they were called light microscopes. And so if you use them, you, you couldn't really see the DNA. And you couldn't see chromosomes that look like these, beads on a string. For the most part, that takes a, an electron microscope or at least a high powered microscope. Um, and so we could see chromosomes when they were in this compacted stage. So we spent a lot of time getting chromosomes uh, at the mitotic form so we can see them, but everybody thinks that, you know, that's the only form that a chromosome takes, right? But we all, of course, know better. Now, how do we get that? Well, primarily, and we'll talk a lot about, you know, this later when we talk about chromosomes and things, one of the ways is to use a chemicals to basically uh, let you, the compression process go on. So you go through G2 over here, okay? And then you get to mitosis, and at metaphase, you want to arrest the process. And a way to do that is to use chemicals. One of those common chemicals has been around for uh, more than half a century is coltracine. Coltracine uh, is a plant-derived chemical, okay, uh, from coltracinum. And what it does, it's a fairly simple, you can see, um, chemical. What it does is it, it blocks tubulin polymerization, okay, uh, and, it, and it sort of stops the formation of the, these tubules. Well, tubules are absolutely critical during the, you know, for all cell activity, but for the process, what it, what it does is that these tubules that are important for pulling apart the chromosomes themselves, okay, so when you start into uh, anaphase, 
P if you're in mitosis, it's just anaphase. If you're in meiosis, anaphase one or anaphase two, either one require the, the con collection uh, and connection of these spindle fibers to the, to the centromeric region of chromosomes, and then they shorten and move and by energy and they you know, the dynine process and they pull everything apart. Well, if you can interrupt this, you can basically break these. They're like big bungee cords, you know, if you can somehow stop the polymerization because <clears throat> microtubules are polymerized units, right? They are units that are made up of two major tubulin groups. One is the beta tubulin group and the other is the alpha. And they're a, they're a sort of a polymerized form that's a, a woven together uh, tubule. Okay, so they make a structure like this uh, in a very regular pattern. And that's required for things to move along through there. Well, it turns out that coltracine uh, is one of the chemicals that will actually attach to um, the um, A2 binding site, okay, of the alpha tubulin, so the alpha tubulin, the green part right here, and when it does, it disrupts this process of the green ones and the white ones shown here uh, actually connecting to each other, so it won't allow full polymerization, it makes a distorted looking uh, microtubule, the microtubule is not functional, and so when you go into to anaphase, you get just breaking apart uh, and non-functioning of the, the cells itself, and you end up with the classic form that we would, you know, you would see. So what you end up with, if you do that, you take a picture, okay, and this is what this is, the picture of mitotic chromosomes. You can see they've replicated, they're in their most compressed form, and we've done basically a splat, okay? So what you do is you take culture scene, you introduce it into the cells as the cells are trying to go through a mitotic process. Um, the cells then stop the mitotic process, right? They, they break, they try, but they can't because the microtubules are malformed. You then do what's known as a, as a splop, <laughs> okay, or a drip drop, uh, chromosome drop. You pull up some of the cells into a class tube or something, and you just, and you literally just drop it down onto a plate. And when it does that, if you're lucky, the chromosomes will spread out, okay, because they're not attached anymore, um, and they will. You'll be able to see them in some pattern like this, okay. So this is a, this is what's known as a karyotype. So this would be a squash or something. Other ways to do it is you drop it and then you put a little light plate on top, okay, a cover plate, and that squishes it and pushes everything out as well, it gives you more separation. People that are good at this, technicians that are good at this, uh, can make some beautiful spreads that look like this. It may take. You may have to look at you know, 30 or 40 cell spreads to see it, but you can find it. And once you have that, then you have the chromosomes. Now, this is, and this is known as, the, this is done with photography, right? Just pull down and you literally just take a picture of it with a camera uh, and then develop it. Um, more modern ways to do it, of course, are to attach all sorts of dyes and, and things that will go into certain spots on chromosomes and attach so that you can uniquely mark each chromosome itself. So what you look like this, but with a computer, you can pull that apart uh, and see that there are specific chromosomes uh, staying with certain colors. Once you hit it with a laser, uh, these will fluoresce to a certain point, uh, and you'll know that you've got this informed. But either way, you get these things. And in the old days, we would print these pictures out take a pair of scissors and carefully cut this chromosome out here and this chromosome out here and this one out here, and then try to figure out, does that one belong with this one or does this one belong with this one? Anyway, you cut them out and you'd use things like the arm links, right? Whether they had this long, the short arm here where the centromere is located or whether it was a, some kind of metas, little metacentric one like this, which probably matched up with that, whether it was an acrocentric, something like this, okay? Well, this technically is called a karyotype. Okay, the karyotyping is when you take a picture, get it prepared, and take a picture of the chromosomes themselves in the cells. You then arrange those into what's known technically as an ideogram. An ideogram is an arrangement of chromosomes starting from large to the smallest, and then usually the sex chromosomes, if they can be identified. And a lot of species, they can't. Of course, in, in mammals and humans, they can, but a lot of species, they can't. If you can identify the sex chromosomes, you put those out. So you start with the, the largest through to the smallest and usually group them in various groups. So there'll be, turns out there are groups of, of them that have a, a metacentric region or an acrocentric region or a submetacentric and you can place them together. So this is a karyotype over here where you've done this, it's called karyotyping is the technique. And this, the end product of a karyotype is the formation of an ideogram. 
okay, a lining up in a standardized way of the chromosomes. Okay. Now, uh, in the popular world, this everything's called a karyotype. Okay, if you type in the word karyotype uh, in Google, you'll probably get a picture that looks something like this. Okay, but technically, it's called an ideogram. Okay. Okay, well, that's nuclear DNA, and we're going to talk a lot about chromosomes. We're going to talk about chromosome structure. We're going to talk a lot about chromosome variants. We're naming chromosomes, molecular names for chromosomes. We're, we'll talk about a lot of that. Um, mitochondrial DNA, I just want to remind you that that's very important in, in existing forms. Okay, so just remind you that the mitochondria is a double membrane uh, unit external membrane and then this sort of folded internal membrane with an inner space, a mitochondrial inner space in here. Um, and there is mitochondrial DNA, right? It's uh, found. Again, if we do this, the centrifugation, we can see the mitochondrial band come out very clearly as certain size are fairly a, a general size to them. Okay. And a lot of activity goes on in here, of course, we have uh, ATP synthase, uh, so this is where ATP production uh, occurs, taking ADP, making it, cycling into ATP, et cetera. Uh, there are pores. The way you get in and out of there are these, are these pores um, that have certain proteins around the outside of the pores. They, they essentially connect in from the outside membrane, the outer membrane, through to the inner membrane like this, and they transport materials in and out. They, water, uh, all sorts of things that will move in and out of these under physiological conditions. Okay. Well, we actually, for a number of years, have worked on a protein uh, that's called P62 or sequestasome. It has a lot of activities. It's a ubiquitous protein in, in cells, um, but it has a lot of activity. It turns out that it has a, plays an important role in mitochondria, and uh, it actually stretches, as you can see here, for, uh, with a piece sticking on the outside all the way in and actually attaches to the internal membrane, the secondary internal membrane here. And it has a number of, of roles that are involved, but one of them is we think is to help things get close to one of these transport units. So one of these actual pores, it's not in part of the pore, uh, it's actually doing some other job. So how in the world do you ever figure that sort of thing out, right? Well, like I said, you could lyse cells, right? You can remove the, the uh, outer membrane of a cell and you can out remove all sorts of parts. It turns out they're detergents, okay? Chemical detergents, as we call them, that are able to basically lyse um, the outer membrane of a mitochondria without lysing the inner, brain, the inner membrane. And then there's some that will lyse both, et cetera. So what you do is you, if you want to figure out, okay, I want to figure out P62, whether this is the uh, carboxyl in, uh, or not, what's sticking out here, you know, and how much of it is sticking out? Well, you start, you just chemically lyse the external part and you see, okay, well, uh, when I do that, it lyses, it'll lyse P62 as well because it's sticking through. And you say, oh, what's left is this fridge down here. I know that's, you know, which region of it. So we've done all these experiments where we've lysed the mitochondria and we can identify exactly which portion of the crosses the membrane, which portion is membrane bound on the inside and what's on the outside, okay? So that's how people do these things. Now, um, mitochondria, of course, have a cell cycle themselves, this uh, mitochondrial cycle, okay? Um, they go from things like punctate, these are where they're small units like this, where they're called fused. Um, they will then join up, they often join up with other other mitochondria. Uh, they'll exchange DNA sometimes between the mitochondria themselves, okay? Um, then it'll become these elongate units, um, and they go through a whole process of fission and fusion, where the fused processes are these things, you know? We always kind of, in cells, draw mitochondria looking like little footballs, like these things right here, okay? And that's true. They, there are a lot of mitochondria that look like that structure right there, but they spend much of their time in these fused type situations. So if we look over on these two fixtures on the right here, this is a, it's a nuclear region uh, of a cell. All of this red stuff is mitochondria. And it's, it's a mito red stain. It's specific for uh, finding mitochondria, just the whole mitochondria. You can take a laser, certain you know, wavelength, hit it, and it fluoresces red. And what you see, these are, these are mitochondria. This is what cellular mitochondria look like, okay? They don't look like this very often, okay? There are, there are punctate forms. 
and they go through cycles. If you stress a cell, uh, more of it will become punctate, looks something like this. If you take cells and put them in other, other physiological conditions, they'll become more uh, stream-like and look like this. And again, they, they fizz and fuse and they exchange DNA and all sorts of things, right? Their, their DNA will move back and forth through them in, the, in this sort of process. And when you have, and mitochondria become dysfunctional, okay? One of the reasons is they lose all their DNA. Um, others is that they are, they just get old and tired and, and parts of them aren't functioning properly. And when they do, they'll become depolarized. Okay? There, there, there are um, systems that will, enzymatic systems that will come in and depolarize them. And once they're depolarized, they're recognized as being as a problem and they'll be getting rid of the cell will basically do a garbage disposal on them and have others. Okay. Anyway, it's a, a really pretty cool process. Uh, fission, fusion, and it's much more complicated than the little pictures, you know, the first little picture that we showed you growing up. All right, we'll talk a, a lot more about uh, mitochondria, but I wanted to finish up with this by just saying, okay, don't forget that mitochondria has uh, a number of genes that are involved. They're, some of them are critical genes, well, all of them are critical. Some of them are not found in the nucleus, have no copy that is found there. Others don't, particularly some of these, these ribosomal genes that are found here. Uh, and there's a 22 tRNA genes, okay? Remember, there are lots of copies of, of tRNA genes, but there's some un unique ones found in the mitochondria. If you were to remove some of these, uh, the mitochondria completely from a cell, it actually wouldn't be able to complete the full process of transcription, or excuse me, translation, because the tRNAs, some of the certain tRNAs might be missing. Uh, but there's protein genes, there's uh, cytochrome B is found here. Uh, COX-2, ATPase, as you might expect. Some of these stay in the inside of the mitochondria themselves and some leave. The mitochondria uh, DNA is double-stranded, like DNA, but it is circular, okay? Uh, there, are no, there are no technical introns or exons, they're all exons. Um, both sides are red, but, but it's primarily one side, as you can see this ND6 is on one side, um, and there are some of the tRNAs and things found here. But the other side is, the, there's one side that's primary. There's a D-loop called the control region or D-loop up here. One of the, this is where replication occurs, starts. A replication actually starts in three different places, but it starts here and it's rolling replication. So it starts out and works all the way around in one direction, okay? It doesn't start, unlike um, the, the replication that occurs in, in a regular chromosome, a nuclear chromosome where you have hundreds or thousands of places that become replication eyes. This only starts in, in one place, starts here for the most part, rolls around through this way, and then uh, concomitantly on the other side, replication goes in this direction. So you get duplication uh, on the light strand as well as at the same time on what's called the heavy strand. Uh, actually, there's a third spot as well where replication also starts here on the heavy strand. The last thing to say about it is that the uh, really what's unique, one of the really unique things about the D-loop is that there's a region in the D-loop where it's actually three strands of DNA. You know, all DNA is double-stranded form, but there's actually a short, small region in the D-loop where it's, it's triple-stranded. It's one of the unique little questions we always tend to ask our graduate students on exams. Uh, tell me where there's some triple DNA. Is DNA always, you know, double-stranded? Oh yeah, of course it is. Well, you know, well, okay, no, it's not. Uh, it's one of those little questions we like to torture it. Um, mitochondrial size varies between organisms, of course, between different species. Humans are, it's a little over 16,000, 16,500 base pairs. Uh, very, very well standardized. Uh, pretty much the same always. Not a lot of indels uh, in human mitochondrial DNA um, since it's a you know, well-protected circular structure. Okay, well, that ends the, the first part of this lecture, basically going over some of the really basic, you know, forms of it. Uh, I now want to, next lecture, I want to talk about some of the cellular pathways. Uh, and in, in doing so, of course, talk about uh, the genetics of some of that.